Alright guys, this is our um, first video for AP Euro on Wednesday, April 29th. We're looking at the impact of industrialization. Industrialization dramatically changed life in Europe because the location of factories tended to be concentrated in certain areas. Cities began to grow and develop rapidly. Industrialization and the urban movement had spawned replaced the putting out or domestic system in which raw materials were delivered to the houses of peasants and then finished products were collected and sold by merchants. The change from rural manufacturing to bring to bringing workers to a location significantly altered life in Britain. By the middle of the century, Great Britain became the first nation to have more people, people living in cities than in the countryside, one of the most dramatic transformations in the history of humankind. Unfortunately, the cities uh, that grew from the ground up as a result of industrialization tend to be awful places for working poor. Poor ventilation and sanitation led to conditions in which the mortality rates were significantly higher for urban dwellers than for those who reside in the countryside. Because people had to use a water supply that came into the direct contact with animal and human feces, cholera became a part of the early 19th century urban landscape, killing tens of thousands of individuals. Industrialization greatly affected the family structure. Uh, the fact that the entire family was working was not new. The earlier domestic system had relied on the family as a cohesive working unit. What was different was, was that the family no longer worked together under one roof, with women and children now often working under conditions even more deplorable than the men. Because factory owners thought that they were less likely to complain. Great Britain's Settler Committee exposed that children were being beaten in factories. As a result, the House of Commons passed the Factory Act, which mandated that children younger than nine could not work in the textile mill. That children younger than twelve could not could no long, could no more than nine could, could work no more than nine hours per day, and that children younger than eighteen couldn't work more than twelve hours each day. But the Act provided for only seven inspectors to ensure compliance. Working class responses to industrialization. At first, workers were befuddled to, as to how to grapple with the economic and social problems caused by industrialization. For some individuals, such as hand loom weavers, complete economic dislocation ensued and the traditional way of life threatened by machinery. Some laborers tried to destroy the machines, which they blamed for their problems. Their fictional leader was Ned Ludd, and the term Luddite has stayed in the modern vocabulary in reference to those who refused to embrace new technologies. Machinery also caused hardship for many laborers on the farms. They created an imaginary character known as Captain Swing, who righted the wrongs imposed on hardworking individuals by the advent of technology. After those rather primitive means of dealing with industrialization proved to be ineffective, workers sought to create cooperative societies, small associations within a given trade that provided funeral benefits and other services for members beginnings of the unions. Despite government disapproval, workers in Great Britain in the late 18th century organized what first were known as friendly societies, and these eventually evolved into full-blown unions once the ban on, on such activities were lifted in 1824. On the continent, it was not until the 1860s that unions were allowed to freely operate in France and in Prussia. Great Britain also took the lead in establishing the first unions and re that represented more than a single industry. In 1834, Robert Owen helped the Grand National Consolidated Trade Union, which several decades later evolved into the Trade Union Congress, pulling together workers from desperate industries. Skilled laborers formed the first unions by the end of the 19th century. However, unions were being formed by dock workers and other non-skilled workers. Unions were a critical reason for the steady improvements in the wages and factory conditions that took place in the second half of the 19th century. Socialism and Karl Marx. Some workers, particularly in, on the continent, found that although the union's emphasis on gradual improvements in wages and hours worked, it was at best only a partial solution to the problems caused by industrialization. Many turned to socialism believing that it offered a complete overhaul to an oppressive society. Socialism had an early roots in the writings of such individuals as St. Simon, Robert Owen, and Charles Fourier. The most significant strand in socialist thought, however, was the so-called scientific socialism offered by Karl Marx. Marx was born in the German city of Trier and eventually received a university education at Jena. As a young man, he became the editor of the Cologne newspaper, the uh, Rheinzunt but he soon found his political views were considered too radical by the authorities who banned the newspaper, leading Marx to seek the freer intellectual climate of Paris. The French, however, quickly grew tired of Marx, so he left Paris for London, where he spent the remainder of his life. Marx and his colleagues, Frederick Engels, organized a Communist League to link the far-flung German socialists, many of whom, like Marx, were living in exile. In 1848, they teamed up to write a pamphlet that was to serve as a basic statement of principles for the organization. This document was the Communist Manifesto, one of the most influential political tracts in history. The very first line contains Marx and Engels' view that all history from the beginning of time consists of the struggle between class, social, social classes, an idea that was labeled as historical materialism or the material dialectic. The origin of this idea can be found in the writings of the German philosopher George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, whose dialect differed from Marx's in that he saw economic conditions 
emanating from ideas rather than the reverse. Heigl's thinking influenced Marx and many others as it seemed to suggest a means towards analyzing historical uh, events. Marx posited it that the feudal age was supplanted by the triumph of the bourgeois class in the 19th century. The development of capitalism led to the creation of a new class, the proletariat, which, which was the working class, who would one day arise to supplant those capitalists who had exploited them. In the beginning of the su supplantation, the state would dominate in what Marx admitted would be a vi violent, though triumphant, struggle by the workers. Eventually, the state would w weather away when it was no longer needed as a result of the elimination of all other classes besides the proletariat. Marx is also known for Das Kapital, an enormous treatise on capitalism that explains the mechanics by which capitalism extracts prop profits from labor, industrialization, and child labor. Interestingly, many workers were against placing constraints on child labor, and it was not that they were monstrous parents. It was simply that wages were so low that children were providing funds that were essential to the part of the family budget. There has been a long-standing and perhaps tired historical debate about the wages earned by individual industrial workers and the t type of life such wages provided. The Optimist School on the Standard of Living debate argues that in the first half of the 19th century, wages did rise somewhat for workers, while prices remained steady or in fact declined, thus allowing for improved living conditions. The Pessimists, on the other hand, claim that horrible work conditions and miserable low wages provided an increasingly bleak existence for working poor. Marx brought a revolutionary dynamism to the class struggle because he believed that the working class had to constantly prepare itself by organizing socialist parties. In 1864, he organized the First International, which Marx said was created to afford a central medium of communication and cooperation for those organizations whose aim was the protection, advancement, and complete emancipation of working classes. The First International was not a completely Marxist organization. Trade unionists, Mazzini, Republicans, Marxists, and anarchists are all, were all members. Internal conflicts eventually led the First International to dissolve. In the 70s, after Marx's death, Engels helped organize the Second, Second International, a loose federation of the World Socialist Party's heavy influence by Marxism that met for the first time in 1889. It was, of course, no accident this meeting took place on the 100th anniversary of the storming of the Bastille. Marxists were consciously re referencing the beginning of the French Revolution and the calling for their own the age of national unification. Metternich once remarked that Italy was a mere geographical expression. He could have said the same for Germany because up until the second half of the 19th century, both lands consisted of a number of independent territories, a disunity that dated back to the Middle Ages. In the late Middle Ages, 1100 to 1500, and the early modern period, 1500 to 1789, the rulers of France, Spain, and Great Britain successfully expanded their authority. In France, uh, this expansion resulted in monarchy destroying the independence of rulers in, of Normandy, Britain, Brittany, and Aquitaine, and incorporating them into the domains of French king. This process was not pre predestined. We could just, just as easily imagine a Europe with modern Spain is divided between a large nation of Portugal and small Aragon, and as it happened, the process of consolidation did not take place in either the northern German territories or the Italian peninsula. However, by the 19th century, individuals in both the German and Italian states sought to create a, uh, a nation state that would unite all Italians or all Germans under one political banner because they shared either a common culture or language, or a fear of foreign domination. This process of a national unification would have a tremendous impact on the future of course of European history. All right, Crimean War. Crimean War was critical to the formation of the centralized states in both Italy and Germany, though it initially was impossible to foresee such a result when the war began in 1854. Several factors led to the outbreak of hostilities, including a controversy over whether nation, uh, whether, over which nation would control access to the religious sites sacred to Christian, uh, Christians in Jerusalem. The main issue, however, was the fear among British and French statesmen that Ottoman weakness was encouraging Russian adventurism in the Balkans, and the possibility that Russians might gain access to the Mediterranean by occupying the port city of Istanbul. Following a naval def defeat by the Ottomans, who had declared war on the Russians in 1853, with British encouragement, France and Great Britain declared war on the Russians. Most of the fighting took place in the Crimean region and was notable for the incre incredible incompetence of the all participants. Most of the half a million casualties did not die in the battle, but perished due to dis disease in filthy field hospitals, something that inspired Florence Nightingale to revolutionize the nursing profession. The war came to an ignominious end after the fall of the Ru Russian forces at uh, Sevastopol, uh, Russia's chief port in the northern Black Sea and nearest access to the Mediterranean. Though reluctant to quit, the Russians were forced to reconsider when the Austrians threatened to enter the war on the side of the British and the French unless the Russia accepted the off offered peace terms. Russia was forced to cede some territories on the Danube River and to accept the ban on warships in the Black Sea region. This was a major blow to the Russian ambitions of involvement in European politics. 
Since the time of Peter the Great, Russia had sought a warm water port in the south, which would, could provide access to the Mediterranean Sea through the Bosphorus and Aegean. Without the power of the Black Sea or the Danube, the Russian Navy was trapped in ports along the Baltic, subject to the Swedish and Danish um, tolls in that 